Great Controversy, chapter 41, The Destruction of the Earth. And we will be starting on page 653. 653. I hope that you have your, your Bibles, your Great Controversy, uh, writing instrument, whatever you need to proceed with this study here today. It is a powerful, powerful study. It was a short chapter, but packed full of uh, lots of just uh, wonderful information to prepare us for the times that are right before us. So let's get into this study, and here we go. I hope. Would help if I turn the device on. Okay, there we go. Her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Where does this come from? Revelation 18, 5 through 10. So this is this is starting off right at the beginning of the chapter, first paragraph, once again, is a wonderful and powerful piece of scripture right here, Revelation 18, 5 through 10. Her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities, and the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. What is this referring to? What entity, what power today could this possibly be referring to? The Roman Catholic Church. It has to be. You see, she says, for I, 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 she says in her heart, I said as a queen, and am no widow. So she is the mother harlot. And she has a lot of daughters. What is a woman reference to in, in Bible in the Bible? It's a church. So this is this is the mother, and then she has all of her daughters that, that come and serve her and bow down to her. Now, why would she say, I sit a queen and am no widow? Was she widowed at one point? So it seemed, during the Reformation, right? Lost a lot of following. There was a, a, a huge disbursement of religious beliefs at that point. Many churches came out of the Reformation. To the point now, today, we have over, I believe, 30,000 different denominations. But according to this, she's no widow. They're all going to bow down to her. We've seen the pictures of the church leaders coming back together, uniting with her. We're not going to dwell on that much today. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. One hour. I wonder how long one hour is. I wonder how long it's going to be. One hour. Um, GC 653. Can I? Um, having her uh, <coughs> plagues come in one day made me think of Job and what Satan did to Job in one day. That's right. That's a, that's a perfect illustration that has been brought out in other chapters. chapters. Of so paying back, uh, being paid back what you've done. Yes. Okay, the merchants of the earth that have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls for in one hour, so great riches is come to none. Now, prophetically speaking, one hour equals about two weeks. Now, I don't know for sure, we don't know for sure, that that is exactly what this is referring to, that it's only going to be two weeks. But obviously, no question about it, it's a very short time period that she has this, this specific power and uh, that she comes to uh, not. Now, I want to compare this passage of Scripture with this passage of Scripture a little bit. Revelation 17, 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. 
Yes. Uh, she had a question about the two week time period. Yes. How do you how do you decide for two weeks? Are you doing that on the year span? And yeah, based on a, a day per year, okay. you calculate that out, and it comes out to be actually fifteen days. Uh, so one hour, once again, one hour with the bee. So this power is going to be in possession with these other ten kings, one hour with the bees. Now, what do you what do you suppose that might be? What time period is that going to be? Do you think? Do you think that's going to be a good significant period of time before the close of probation, before the time of, pr of trouble? I think if you study this out, you'll find that this is the time period beginning at the institution of the Sunday law. It's going to be a very short period of time, and it's going to be after probation is closed and the Sunday law is enforced. But I want to focus on this just a little bit here, the ten horns, which are ten kings, and these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. The beast of Revelation 17. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So was John in the, in the spirit right there in his day and time? No, he was carried away in the spirit into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, where are God's people supposed to be? They're in the wilderness, right? But now this scarlet-colored beast is in the wilderness, okay? And it has seven heads and ten horns, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Mountains uh, refer to kingdoms, okay, on which the woman sitteth. So the woman is sitting on top of these, uh, these, these mountain tops. And there are seven kings. Five have already fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Now, I've covered this before in a message called The Mysteries of Revelation 17. So if you want to see the full study on this, just go back to that, that message and you will find the full study here. But I'm going to briefly go over it just so that we can catch up to speed. Okay, so if you look at uh, Revelation uh, chapter 17 and verse 10, you're going to see it says five are fallen, one is, one rules for a short period of time, and then the eight is, 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 is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So you see that clearly. Um, and we see in the early uh, 1900s, 1929, and the Lateran Treaty, that uh, we have Pope Pius XI, was the first king as Gaspari and Mussolini re reinstituted this sovereign power. Their kingdom and authority was given back to them. They are once again, at that point, became not only the religious leader of the world, the, the, the Pope you know, sees himself as the, the religious leader of the world, God or Christ on earth, the vicar of Christ, right? But also, that became, he became a monarch. So now it's the combination, once again, of church and state, of religious and political power, and that began in 1929. So he would be the first king, and then we can count right down the line, and we'll see Pope John II, he was uh, the, the pope for, for a long time, about 28 years, I believe, and it says one is. So I believe that when, he was, when John was carried away in the spirit, he was carried away in the spirit to the time when Pope John Paul II was in power, because he says one is. And at that time, we also <coughs> see with the United States, where where God's Protestant Reformation, you know, people are supposed to be, Reformed people are supposed to be. We see that we united with um, with Rome <coughs> once again, and 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 we had an ambassador to Rome for the first time. So very important. And then Pope Benedict. He ruled only for a short time. He he uh, he retired, and that's very interesting as well. And then, of course, Pope Francis would be the eighth king, and he is supposed to be the one that would be leading us to perdition. And this is the ten proposed kingdoms that they have um, allegated in different regions here. 
And it's very interesting if you, and, and this is, there's some variations to this. This is just one of the different variations, but um, this is basically uh, the best one that I found. And if you look, you will find that we have Peter Hans Klogenbach, he's the black pope. You know, we have, they have black popes and white popes, not black because of their skin color, but because they wear black all the time. And then there's the white pope, which is the front man. Okay, so Peter Hans Klogenbach, he stepped down as the Jesuit general. And then Adolfo Nicholas became the Jesuit general. And then he has stepped down, and Arturo Sosa is now the new Jesuit general. So we actually have three, all three of these are still alive. All three of these men are still alive today. And then, if you take into consideration that Pope Benedict also stepped down, all of these are just, just total anomalies that never happen. They don't typically step down. They stay in their position until they die. But we also have Benedict that stepped down, and now we have Pope Francis, who is a known Jesuit, openly. So we have five popes alive right now, and there's ten divisions. So two for each pope. That works out nice. Well, what about the kings of the earth, Revelation 17 and verse 2? These are the kings of the earth. This is the, the UN, okay? And this is Pope Francis speaking and giving his address at the UN. That, that happens every year. They all come together every year. But what about the what about the money? You know, we're we're told that they wax rich, right? The merchants of the earth wax rich. Well, this is actually how are they all connected? Well, this is I know the print is very small, I apologize, it's hard to read, but all these major corporations all around the world, they're all tied together with different board members and CEOs. I mean, you have Walt Disney, Boeing, uh, U.S. Bank. I mean, these are, and you have uh, Visa, Walmart. Um, I mean, they're all united. There's uh, Wells Fargo, some of the banks and things, J.P. Morgan and Chase. I mean, all these different corporations, they're all linked and tied together by board member CEOs. So can you see how this could all come apart in, in a heartbeat? Very quickly, it can all come apart. The merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies, Revelation 18 and verse 3. Well, is it happening? Is it possible? that all this could come into play. Well, uh, CNN Catholic News Agency, Cardinal uh, Parolin, Vatican Secretary of State at the elite Bilderberger meeting. Anybody know about the Bilderbergers? The Bilderbergers are the top 1% elite in the world. They control all the money in the world, and they get, they get together every year, and they plan what they're going to do the next year. And here, here we have a representative from the Vatican going there. Annual private gathering of global uh, political, business, and media leaders set to take place this year in Turin, Italy, June 7 through 10. If, if his participation were confirmed, it would be the first time high-ranking Vatican official has taken part in the Bilderberger conferences. The Bilderberger meeting's official website stresses that the discussions are private. No minutes are taken and no reports are written. Isn't that interesting? It's secretive. You see that? It's secretive. Dubbed by critics to be a kind of global shadow government and targeted by protesters who picket the meetings. There's, a, there's an outrage against it. But you don't hear about any of that. Cardinal warns of possible collapse of Earth's uh, livability at Vatican event. So, um, July 6 through 7, uh, event among some 400 global faith leaders, scientists, and politicians with hopes to influence separate meetings later this year of the International Monetary Fund, Monetary Fund, the World Banks, the World Bank, and the UN Climate Change Conference. All this stuff is, 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 is happening. I mean, we are, we are literally on the brink of any of this just coming completely to fruition. And uh, what a startling uh, and, and I mean, it, it just, it's just a matter of whenever I believe God says that the time is right and he withdraws his spirit. That's when it can happen. 
it's, it's, it can be happy, it can happen to that too. Such are the judgments that fall upon Babylon in the day of the visitation of God's wrath. She has filled up the measure of her iniquity. Her time has come. She is ripe for destruction. She is ripe right now for destruction, I believe. GC 653.3. Revelation 17, 16, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So the ten horns, these rulers of the earth, these ten kings that are going to be ruling in the, in the last days, what are they going to do? They're going to turn on that whore. They're going to turn on They're going to make her desolate and naked, and eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. They're going to see that all of their dreams and hopes, every uh, their, their money, all of the, the, the livelihood of their life, the aspirations of it, it's all going to be coming to naught. They see too late the wickedness. Too late. Too late they see it. And uh, so that's they what, end up turning on her. That's what naked, naked means, that everything she's ever done is now open. When the voice of God turns the captivity of his people, there is a terrible awakening of those who have lost all in the great conflict of life. While probation continued, they were blinded by Satan's deception, you see. And they justified their course of sin. Mm -hmm. The rich prided themselves upon the mm -hmm. their superiority to, uh, to those who were less favored. Mm -hmm. But they had obtained their riches by violation of the law of God. You never ever want to obtain riches by breaking the laws of God. We don't want to do that. They had neglected to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to deal justly, and to love mercy. They had sought to exalt themselves and to obtain the homage of their fellow creatures. Now they are stripped of all that made them great and are left destitute and defenseless. They look with terror upon the destruction of the idols which they preferred before their maker. The idols that they loved more than their creator God, right? Mm. They have sold their souls for earthly riches and enjoyments and have not sought to become rich toward God. We need to, we need to seek richness in God. We need to store treasure in heaven, not even where you're on this earth. The result is their lives are a failure. Their pleasures are now turned to gall, their treasures to corruption. The gain of the lifetime is swept away in a moment. Amen. The rich uh, bemoan the destruction of their grand Amen. houses, the scattering of their gold and silver, silver, but their limitations are silenced by the fear that they, this is this, hmm. themselves are to perish with their lives. What a sad state of affairs. To finally realize and recognize that you're going to perish with you. What a fearful thought. The wicked are filled with, filled with regret, not because of their sinful neglect of God, it's not because of that, and their fellow men, but because God has conquered. They're filled with regret because God has conquered. He actually will do what he has been predicting and saying that he's going to do. He's been prophesying it for 6,000 years, what he's going to do. And they're upset because he's done what he said he's going to do. And he's they lament that the result is what it is, but they do not repent of their wickedness. There's no hope for them. They're so corrupt and destitute spiritually. They would leave no means untried to conquer if they could. If there was some way that they could overturn God, they would do it. No question. The world see the very class whom they have mocked and derided and desired to exterminate pass unharmed through the pestilence, the tempest, and the earthquake. When all of these things are shaking, the earth, the world is shaking. Praise God, those that are the faithful souls will walk in the heart. Hmm. How do you think that's going to be concluded? Not going to like it. He who is to the transgressor of his law a devouring fire is to his people a safe pillar. Isn't that beautiful? 
God is a safe pavilion for us. That's why in Matthew it says that at the end, <coughs> 28, that I'll be with you even into the end of this world. That's right. Amen. <laughs> the minister, uh oh, the minister who has sacrificed truth to gain the favor of men now discerns the character and influence of his teaching. Too late, too late, he figures out that he's been doing the wrong thing. He's been, he's been leading people astray. It is apparent that the omniscient, omniscient eye was following him as he stood at the desk, which is the pulpit, as he walked the streets, as he mingled with men in the various scenes of life. Every emotion of the soul, every line written, every word uttered, every act that led men to rest in a refuge of falsehood. You see how soft it is to be in a position like this? how important it is to stand true to the truth, has been scattering the seed, and now in the wretched, lost souls around him, he beholds the harvest. Is this a, is this a blessed harvest? No. It's sad. It's sad. Saith the Lord, they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. There is no peace that we're enjoying right now. We're not in a peaceful time. It may seem as though there is a peaceful time, but it's really not. Under the surface, there's a great tumult stirring. With lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. So they're doing everything just backwards. Everything's backwards. They're lifting up the ones that are sinful, and they're tearing down the ones who are living up to the standard. And strengthen the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. And there was no life in that direction. GC 655. Woe be unto the pastors. Jeremiah 23, verse 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastors, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, who have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 25, 34, and 35. How ye shepherds, and cry and wallow yourselves in the ashes, ye principal of the flock the principle of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and of your dispersion are accomplished, and ye shall fall like a pleasant vessel. And the shepherd shall have no way to flee, nor the principle of the flock to escape. The principle of the flock, the shepherd, the pastor, the leadership, okay? That's the leadership. That's what's being referenced to. Many of the wicked were greatly enraged as they suffered the effects of the plagues. It was a scene of fearful agony. Parents were bitterly reproaching their children, and children their parents, brothers their sisters, and sisters their brothers. You see how it's it's, it's, it's a mirror image of what happened after the very first sin of the only thing. What did Adam do? He blamed his wife. What did the wife do? She blamed the serpent. It's the same thing. It was you, except on a much grander scale, of course. It was you who kept me from receiving the truth which would have saved me from this awful hour. Please, don't let friends, family, anyone, even, I hate to say it, your own spouse, cause you to miss out on the hard time. You don't want to be among that group that's blaming his, his or her spouse, spouse or brothers or sisters, what happened? The people turned upon their ministers with bitter hate and reproached them, saying, you have not warned us. Hmm. That is the minister's job, is to warn the flock. That's what we're supposed to do as ministers of the gospel, to warn the flock, not to stand up here week after week and tell you, Jesus loves you, everybody's going to make it into the kingdom, just be a good person. You are by yourself in hell. And I don't mean an eternal burning hell. I'm talking about the hell that runs you up. The only true love. You told us that all the world was to be converted. There it is. And it's not, not what we hear today. Even from our own SDA pulpits. 
You cried peace, peace, and quiet every fear that was aroused. You have not told us of this hour, and those who warned us of it, you declared to be fanatics. <laughs> Ever been told you're a fanatic? I have. Mercy. Mm -hmm. An evil man. I've been told multiple times that I'm doing Satan's work. And all I'm trying to do is warn people that the end is coming. To get ready. Who would war, who would ruin us? That's that's what they're they're they're, they're uh, scattering the seed, dispersing the flock, and telling the the good people that they are the ones that are ruining the flock. Being divisive, if you will. But I saw that the ministers did not escape the wrath of God. Their suffering was tenfold greater than that of their people. Tenfold greater. Is this something to take lightly? Is this duty that we, this, this position that we stand in the desk, is it something to take lightly? This is a early writing to 282, by the way. That's not from the very controversy, but it ties in perfectly. Mm -hmm. So what are we seeing today? What are we seeing? Oh, this this is heart, heartbreaking to me. New website dedicated to crafting welcoming statements for Seventh-day Adventist churches, March 2018. In practice, however, Adventist churches at times have been exclusive and repellent. We have closed doors to people who didn't behave like us or think like us or look like us. We have cared more about being right than about being kind. Is there some truth to that? Sure, there is. But is this a door we need to fling wide open? Are we supposed to bring everyone in and shh, don't say anything, just, just don't say anything, just let them live their lives? Drinking, homosexuality, you name it. Are we supposed to warn? That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about flinging the door wide open. Okay? We're just using this, this excuse as a catalyst. We have confused acceptance with agreement. We have been too motivated by fear. Now is the time to be more intentional concerning the openness and warmth of our local church climates. Should we invite anyone and everyone into our congregation that is interested in seeking for the truth? Absolutely. We should never close the door no matter what their status is. We should always have an open door. But if they come in and, and cause havoc, then something needs to be done about it. If they're causing the flock to, the, the good flock, the good, God's good people to disperse, to, to backslide and fall away, then there's a problem we need to address. Now is the time to be more intentional concerning the openness and warmth of our local church climates. As important as, our, as a mission or vision, a welcoming statement gives the church a face. In this time of authentic Revival, so the other revivals in the past, they weren't authentic. And Reformation, when the fresh wind, the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit, there's, I mean, there's only one wind of the Holy Spirit, blows where it will, any movement by Seventh-day Adventist congregation toward hospitality is something to be celebrated. Okay, we're celebrating. Below is a list of 23 churches of Seventh-day Adventist churches that have published a church welcoming statement. The breadth and richness of approaches is inspiring. Florida Hospital Church, Glendale City Church, Green Lake Church, Kettering SBA Church, Hollywood Seventh-day Adventist Church. These are the ones that they're commending. These are the examples that we are to follow, okay? According to this article from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, what are these churches that they're referring to all about? Well, this is Hollywood Church, where they have a transgender elder who is still a transgender elder practicing um, being a, a woman when he's really a man. This is the Glendale Church, where they had a gay pride month last year, all month long, the month of June. Could you back that picture up for me? 
That one? That one. Where it says, this is a church that does not care about your religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. All, All those, those things, things don't matter. Mm -hmm. It is very obvious that this is a loving church because they have a transgender elder. A transgender elder? Are you kidding me? I mean, have a transgender come into your church and, and, and repent and confess and, and be willing to change by the power of God? Amen. But to, to have one practicing and put them in as the elder of the church? This is Gay Pride Month. They had a huge party at the last uh, last of the month, last Sabbath of the month. On, in, during Sabbath hours, they had a, uh, a party here celebrating their, their whole month of Gay Pride Month. They had a DJ in there singing worldly music. It's terrible. So these, these are all churches that we're supposed to aspire to. The hospital church, this is the Florida Hospital Church of Seventh-day Adventists. This, this is the head elder, Andy, I'm sorry, the head uh, senior pastor, Andy McDonald. And he's talking about how we just need to embrace all these different LGBT groups of people. Okay. This one, John McClarty, the Green Lake Church, another one we're supposed to aspire to now, telling us that we need to get rid of the clobber text, that we need to just, just did a whole thing on it, did a, uh, played this movie that they came out with about a gay, seventh gay Adventism. We need to do away with the clobber text. Mercy. And this guy right here, he's just, he is the president of Oakwood University. President of Oakwood University. O Oakwood University is a huge college. And here in this message right here, he states that, that our, the people of God include the homosexuals, the lesbians, the transgenders. He says, look out. Here it comes. Here comes Caitlyn Jenner. Get ready. Here comes Caitlyn Jenner. To applause. People applauded. Mercy. Now this is something that no one's really talking about. Even within the um, present truth community of the, the present truth pastors, almost no one is talking about it. And I, and I give I give appreciation to this man, uh, Andrew, pro-life Andrew, for standing up. He's one of the few. And he has a YouTube channel, and um, he is very, very blunt, so be prepared. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. But in this video, he's talking about the NAD and how, you know, it's, it's an uncomfortable topic, I understand. And a lot of us have made this mistake of, you know, getting pregnant out of wedlock, uh, deciding to abort, abort the child. If that, praise God, I've never been in that situation. If that is something that has happened in your life, I pray that you have sought forgiveness for it and repented of it. Okay? God can forgive all sins. I mean, look at Solomon and mm -hmm. sacrifice. David. And David. Terrible things. God can, can forgive these sins. But we must repent of them and get forgiveness for them. But he says... In this particular video, that North America, Seventh Avenue Church, has murdered more, more, murdered more blacks than the KKK. That's all right. But what did our forefathers call abortion? Every single one of them referred to it as murder. Mm -hmm. What happened when Mary visited um, uh, Elizabeth? What happened? John the Baptist was in the womb. What happened? Yeah. He left. He left in the womb, proving that a child is a child from the Bible, even while it's still in the womb. But they say no. Planned Parenthood said no, it says no. That child's not a, not a person until it actually breathes its first breath. Mm -hmm. And they're killing these babies while they're still in the womb and pulling them out. It's, 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 it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. But here it is. Uh, he did he did the crunch the numbers on it. And uh, the KKK is responsible for killing somewhere between three and 4,000. And the uh, um, North American church here, uh, over 5,000. And this lady right here, her name is Sheila Jackson Lee. She is a congresswoman, and she is a Seventh-day Adventist in name. In name, I say that. She was um, at Oakwood University receiving a 
Achievement Award. But what does the world think of this lady? Well, headline here reads, Jackson Lee, again, named Venus Congress member, uh, the, day, the Daily Caller, Congress the Congressional Bosses from Hell, Sheila Jackson Lee. She is actively promoting Planned Parenthood and passing laws, bills, that give pro-choice. And she's at Oakwood University receiving an award and preaching and, and, and speaking to these people and giving them guidance. Mercy. And the majority, this is the sad, I don't know if you want to call it irony or what you want to call it, but the sad fact is there's more blacks that get aborted than whites or even Hispanics. She's, she's fighting against her own race. And we, we looked at this, and uh, the message, is it choice or is it murder? And you can see that video as well if you want to see the full study. But I talked about this, this man right here, Edward Alden, Dr. Edward Alden. And he's giving lots of money to Loma Linda University. He has his plaque up on the wall. They give him huge accolades. Just praise the man for his contribution. And this is uh, La Sierra University. And it says here, well, let me back up. Thoughtful generosity will forever be an example to our students, reminding them to make a difference with the resources that God has trusted to their care. Forever be an example. Let that sink in for a minute. Forever be an example. Right here in this article, he says, I don't mean to toot my own horn, but it's safe to say that I have far more experience than anyone else in the United States in doing this particular thing. He said, 250,000 abortions in 10 years. Praising it. Boasting about it. And the majority of the people that he wanted to, to have abortions, blacks of his faith. It's an abomination. This, this man is kill far more Hispanics or blacks than anyone else. So he's tied to the uh, monument in Georgia. Which one? The, uh, the, the, uh, so the Yeah, The ones telling us that, uh, you know, they want to eliminate the, uh, the population. Godson. Yeah, the Godson, Godson. Georgia Godson. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've never been to him, but I've heard of him. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. Well, that's interesting, too. And, and isn't it interesting, at the very top, the first commandment is keep the population under 500 million. Well, he has done his best to see that happen. Ministers and people see that they have not sustained the right relation to God. And, you know, La Sierra, Loma Linda, flagship institutions. Even Oakwood University, a flagship institution. How can we support that? How can we, how can we support an institution that is okay and promotes childhood murder? How can we pay our tithes and offerings and support that kind of a movement, that kind of a, an institution? How can we do that in good conscience? Are we not guilty by association? Be careful, friends. I don't know how, I don't know how we can do that. I can't. I, because you know when you pay your tithe, the percentage of that goes to the, the general public. And the percentage of that goes to support this hideousness, murderous hideousness. It's terrible. Not to mention all the other uh, abominations that are going on. They see that they have rebelled against the author of all just and righteous law. The setting aside of the divine precepts gave rise to thousands of springs of evil, discord, hatred, iniquity, until the earth became one vast field of strife, one sink of corruption. That is where we are going. That is, we are right there. This is the view that now appears to those who rejected truth and chose to cherish error. No language can express the longing which the disobedient and disloyal feel for that which they have lost forever eternal life. Sadly. Men whom the world has worshipped for their talents 
and eloquence now see these things in their true light. They realize what they have forfeited by transgression, and they fall at the feet of those whose fidelity they have despised and derided and confess that God has loved them. You see how it turns around? You see how it's going to turn around? In the end, they're going to see their problem. They're going to see where they have fallen. And they're going to confess and bow their feet if we're to be saying like the Lord. We've done what we're supposed to do. The people see that they have been deluded. They accuse one another of having uh, led them to destruction. But all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. They all turn against the ministers. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. Beware of smooth things coming from pastors. It feels good. It's nice to go to church and you have a feel-good message and you don't have any, any kind of guilt or any kind of weightiness on your conscience and you can just walk out of there and just be laughing and happy and no problem. But the Bible says, watch out. Be warned about these ministers who preach smooth things. It's deadly. It's deadly. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of, of deception. They end up confessing it. They admit it. The multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false shepherds. The very ones that once admired them the most will pronounce the most just. Have you seen that? Have you seen um, Different people in the congregations that just admire certain pastors. Be careful, folks. They're just men, and today women. But they're very talented, just misusing it. That's right. Yeah, misusing it. The most dreadful curses upon them, the very hands that once crowned them with laurels, will be raised for their destruction. The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. <laughs> Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. Have mercy. You see six five five. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nation. He will plead with all flesh. He pleads with us to come and to not die. Come and, and let him shelter us under his wings. He pleads with us. He will give them that wicked he will give them that are wicked to the sword. Jeremiah twenty five thirty one. For 6,000 years, the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and his heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men to warn, enlighten. That's what we need to do. Now all have made their decisions. It's, it's over. The wicked have fully united with Satan in his warfare against God. The time has come for God to vindicate the authority of his downtrodden law. It always comes back to his law. We are never to downtrod the law of God. We are to lift it up and to keep it in God's strength. And in Jesus, in Jesus, we can do it. Now the controversy is not alone with Satan, but with men. The Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. You see, six, five, six. The mark of deliverance. You know there's the mark of the beast. We're all afraid of it, right? There's also a mark of deliverance. Just having a mark doesn't mean a bad thing necessarily. If you have the mark of God, awesome. Praise the Lord. If you have the mark of the beast, you in trouble. The mark of deliverance has been set upon those that sigh and that cry for the abominations that be done. We need to be mournful of what's going on in our world and in our church today. And if we don't <coughs> bring it to uh, the people's attention and our own attention, if we are silent, then we are also going to be held accountable for that. Now the angel of death goes forth, represented in Ezekiel's vision by the men with the slaughtering weapons, to whom the command is given, slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin <clears throat> at my sanctuary. Where does it begin? At the people of God, with the people of God. It begins at his church. That's where it starts. It says the prophet, they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Ezekiel 9, 1 through 6. 
The work of destruction begins among those who have professed to be the spiritual guardians of the people. The false watchmen are the first to fall. We don't want to be a false watchman. And by the way, we're all to be watchmen. If we have the truth, if we are Seventh-day Adventists, true Seventh-day Adventists, not just in word, but truly Seventh-day Adventists, we are called to be watchmen. There are none to pity or to spare. Men, women, maidens, and little children perish together. It's so sad. It's hard to believe that God would do such a thing. It's a strange act. The Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. That's our thing in Isaiah 26. The people that say that God doesn't punish, that he doesn't kill. <clears throat> Such a farce. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall be consumed away. <clears throat> this is kind of uh, descriptive and it's not very pleasant to look at, but uh, it's in the Bible and uh, we, should, we should understand it. Away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes shall consume away in their holes and their tongue shall consume away in their mouths. While they're standing there they will just absolutely just melt like wax. Unbelievable seeing this going be. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other and of the end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. So they're just going to be dead bodies laying everywhere. Hmm. What a protest scene. So remember this point. Remember that they're all going to pass away. They're going to come back and focus your sin. At the coming of Christ, the wicked are blotted from the face of the whole earth, consumed with the spirit of his mouth, and destroyed by the brightness of his glory. When Christ comes, what's going to happen to the wicked? They're consumed. They're consumed. Just, just hold that in, in your mind. Christ takes his people to the city of God, and the earth is emptied of its inhabitants. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land shall be utterly empty and utterly full, for the Lord hath spoken this word. Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Again, it comes back to the law. Hmm. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are run. The whole earth appears like a desolate wilderness. There's not going to be anything here. There's not going to be a time period when people can have another chance to get it right. If you miss the first bus, you know you can catch the second one. Mm -hmm. You know that? Yeah. Left behind nonsense. Now the day, the event takes place foreshadowed in the last solemn service of the Day of Atonement. When the ministration in the Holy of Holies had been completed and the sins of Israel had been removed from the sanctuary by virtue of the blood of the sin offering, then the scapegoat was presented alive before the Lord. And in the presence of the congregation, the high priest and in the, I'm sorry, in the presence of the, the congregation, the high priest confessed over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the what? The scapegoat. And what was he represented? Uh, represent, what did he represent? Satan, right? In like manner, when the work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary has been completed, then in the presence of God and heavenly angels and the host of the redeemed, the sins of God's people will be placed upon Satan. So our sins... We're all saved. Our sins will be placed upon Satan. Because he was the temple. He will be declared guilty of all the evil which he has done, and which he has caused them to commit. And as the scapegoat was sent away into the land not inhabited, not inhabited, so Satan will be banished to the desolate earth and inhabited and dreary wilderness. You see, five plus six fifty eight. The revelator, <clears throat> the revelator foretells the banishment of Satan and the condition of chaos and destruction to which the earth is to be reduced. And he declares that the, the, this condition will exist for a thousand years. 
After uh, presenting the scenes of the Lord's second coming and the destruction of the wicked, the prophecy continues. I saw an angel came down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on that on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should de he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Revelation 21 through uh, 3. So we see here that it's going to be a thousand years. He's going to be, is he going to be literally in chains? No. I don't think so. His circumstances, exactly, are going to be his chains. We're going to look at this a little bit more. That the expression bottomless pit represents the earth in a state of confusion and darkness is evident from other scriptures concerning the condition of the earth. In the beginning, the Bible record says that it was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Hebrew word translated for deep is rendered, uh, rendered from the Septuagint Greek translation of the Old Testament, the same word rendered as bottomless pit. So it's going to be a reversion, a, a, a reversing back to before creation. creation. In, in some part. I don't think it's going to be fully, but in some part. Uh, prophecy teaches that it will be brought back partially at least to the, partially at least to this condition. Looking forward to the great day of God, the prophet Jeremiah declares, I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void, etc., etc. Here is to be the home of Satan with his evil angels for a thousand years. Limited to the earth, he will not have access to other worlds to tempt and annoy those who have never fallen. It is in this sense that he is bound. It's in that very sense that he has no one else to tempt. Everyone is dead. He is just bound to this earth. And this is even more interesting here in just a few minutes. Um, there are none remaining upon whom he can exercise his power. He is wholly cut off from the work of deception and ruin, which for so many centuries has been his sole delight. Mm -hmm. The prophet Isaiah, looking forward to the time of Satan's overthrow, exclaims, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? But wait, right here he said, I'm going to exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. It is not going to work out for Satan that way. It's not <clears throat> For 6,000 years, Satan's work of rebellion has made the earth to tremble. He has made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof. And he opened not the houses of his prisoners. For 6,000 years, his prison house has received God's people, and he would have held them captive forever. But Christ has broken his bonds and set the prisoners free. Praise the Lord. Christ has come and loosed the prison doors for us when he died on the cross for our sins. He gave us, gave us an opportunity for uh, everlasting life. Even the wicked are now placed beyond the power of Satan, and alone with his evil angels, he, remain, he, he remains to realize the effect of the force which sin has brought. The kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory. Every one is his own house, the grave, but thou art cast out of thy grave, out of thy grave like an abominable branch. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. For a thousand years, Satan will wander to and fro in the, in the desolate earth to behold the results of his rebellion against the law of God. During this time, his sufferings are intense. Since his fall, his life of unceasing activity has vanished. Reflection. He hasn't had any opportunity. He's been so busy doing this devilish work. But he is now deprived of his power. Isn't that interesting? I saw that. I just jumped off the page again. That now, at this point, Satan is deprived of his power. I don't believe he's going to have the power to get off the ground. You know, he was walking to and fro, right? Wandering to and fro. He's walking. He can't even fly away. Right now, he can go in and out however he likes. But at that time, his power is going to be deprived. He's not going to have his power anymore. Mm -hmm. Wow. And left to contemplate the part which he has acted since first he rebelled against the government of heaven. He's going to have this thousand years of going over all these scenes in his mind. Mm -hmm. oh, and ugly too. Just awful. 
and to look forward with trembling and terror to the dreadful future when he must suffer for all the evil that he has done and be punished for sin that he has caused to be committed. To God's people, the captivity of Satan will bring gladness and rejoicing. Why do you think that's going to happen? Because we know at that point the sin, the suffering, the trials, the tribulation, it's all behind us. It's going to be a time of rejoicing. During the thousand years between the first and the second resurrection, the judgments of the wicked take place. The Apostle Paul points to this judgment as an event that follows the second advent. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, with both, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Daniel declares that when the Ancient of Days came, judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. At this time, the righteous uh, reign as kings and priests unto God. John, in the Revelation, says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. It is at this time that, as foretold by Paul, the saints shall judge the world. We will actually be judging the world. Isn't that incredible? Now, if we, if we decide we want to say, well, this person, I don't think this person's really really deserving of death here, that person needs to come on into heaven. Is that going to happen? No. Because God, because Jesus, he judge, judges righteously, right? And he knows. We will just be able to confirm everything that, um, that he has already done. <clears throat> In union with Christ, they judge the wicked. So we're going to be right there with Christ. Comparing our acts with the, with the statute, book, the Bible, and deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. Then the portion which the wicked must suffer is meted out according to their works, and it is reported against their names in, look at this, the yeah. book of death. We hear about the book of life quite a bit, but did you know there's a book of death? That's the book you don't want to be in, that's for sure. Satan also and evil angels are judged by Christ and his people, says Paul, know ye not that ye shall judge angels? That's incredible. God's going to love us so much that he's going to allow us to even see what the angels did and the reason for why they fell. Jude declares that the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he that reserved and he hath reserved in everlasting chains and the darkness unto the judgment of the great day. At the close of a thousand years, the second resurrection will take place. You see, there's no way that the wicked are going to have a second chance because they're dead. There's nothing here. They're not going to have a, ch a chance to redeem themselves. It's very clear from Scripture. They're not going to have that opportunity. Then the wicked will be raised from the dead and appear before God for the execution of the judgment written. So it's going to be at that time that the final judgment and execution is given. Thus, the revelator, after describing the resurrection of the righteous, says, The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. It's, it's in scriptures, right there. Isaiah declares concerning the wicked, They shall be gathered together as prisoners, are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 24, 22, Great Controversy 6, 61. Now, is, is this a very pleasant scene that we've just gone over? It's not, is it? It's kind of dismal and sickening. Well, thank the Lord. We have great promises. Thank the Lord for the beautiful scenery that we can still see here in our uh, sinful world. But I love this scripture here Revelation 22, 17, 20 through 21. Shall we all read it together? And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's the end of the book. Mm. That's the end of the book. That's the last two verses in Revelation 22. 
in such a great cause and hope that we have. If we will just turn from our evil way, if we will just look to Christ for our strength, if we will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, if we will allow Him to come into our hearts and live up to the standard that He wants us to live up to, we can have eternal life. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fear this destruction. We can be among those who walk in the heart. And who spread their arms open wide and come to the files of the Lord and to hear those words. Well done, my very faithful servant. And you're in the And we all be a part of that. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the promises that we have seen here today. Thank you for your love and mercy and your grace. Thank you so much for the land and the slain and the foundation of this world that we have this hope that we can cling to Christ our strong power and know and be assured that if we follow the land, whether so ever be good, we will be among those who are saved. Please bless us to that end today. Please lead and guide us. Because we ask and we pray these things in the name and the power and the blood of Jesus Christ.